this time. I'm hoping the slide advance will work this time too. <laughs> it was right. perfect when we tested it, but in the last session, I could only advance it by scrolling my mouse wheel, which was not terribly precise. So it was a lot of too much, too much. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to guess that pretty much everyone is here already because it seemed to have worked better at that time. So let's, we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, I see some familiar faces from my last session. So um, I'm Michelle Kokolos. I'm a program manager at the Environmental Finance Center. I'm joined by my co-facilitator this evening, Carol Barth with the County Department of the Environment. So she'll be here to answer technical questions and listen and learn. And she's handling all of our slide action and note taking this evening. Um, we're going to go through a couple brief slides introducing what we're talking about this evening. And then we'll move into um, your questions and thoughts on this topic. And it looks like we've got a decent sized group, but not huge. I encourage you to use the chat to Enter your thoughts and comments. We'll be following up on those and things will be addressed as we move forward. And then as we get into the discussion process, if there are people, if you're comfortable speaking, feel free to um, raise your hand and unmute yourself and I can call on you to actually say what you want to say rather than typing it. So this session is focused on increasing access to healthy foods, promoting sustainable low carbon, low carbon conservationist agricultural practices. Uh, Carol, if you want to go to the next slide. So just briefly, I want to cover some of the benefits of increasing access to healthy and sustainable food systems. Um, environmentally, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce smog and particular particulate air pollution. Um, human health wise, obviously, there's tons of human health benefits if you have access to healthy and sustainable foods. Um, there's a positive impact on air quality and public health, improving diet and health outcomes as well. And then economically speaking, um, we can boost economic and community vitality by bringing new food outlets, out, food outlets into underserved areas. This can provide an economic stimulus in communities that may need it the most. Um, we can increase property values in the immediate vicinity of these facilities. And obviously buying local food means that your money is staying in your local economy and you're supporting, excuse me, support, supporting the people in your community. Um, next slide, please. So just a snapshot of efforts that are currently happening in the county. You can read all of the things that are on here, but um, Prince George's County launched a Food Equity Council in 2013, and the county received the Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Certification in 2014. Um, in 2015, the county passed legislation allowing retail food trucks back into the county. And in 2016, the urban farm legislation was passed, which allowed farming on 73% of the land in the county, which I think is, is huge that so much of the county, county can be used for agriculture. Um, the county also funded a permanent full-time urban soil and water conservationist to provide technical assistance to urban farms, which is also great. And personally, I think it's fabulous that the county established its first wine trail in, in 2018. I think that's something that we can all get down with. Um, and there's a lot of things that are happening, but those are just some of the highlights. Next slide, please. And um, there are changes that are happening in the, in the county. Um, the acres of farmland in the county has reduced from uh, over 62,000 acres in 1987 to under 32,000 acres in 2012. So that's a, a vast reduction of the amount of farmland in the county. Um, on the upside, there are 24 community gardens, 23 school gardens, and nine urban farms in the county, which is uh, great. Um, 
more farmers markets are accepting food stamps or the SNAP program benefits and offering matching programs, trying to make healthy food accessible to those who need financial support. Um, and the county has been funding the Maryland Money Market Program to increase food access. Um, there are currently three breweries, four wineries, and one distillery in the county. Um, and there's a growing number of agricultural education programs, farm venues, and farm stays that are happening within the county. So even though the um, amount, the acres of farmland has gone down in the past, recent past, there's a lot of good things happening to um, promote the local food culture. And next slide, please. So the um, Climate Action Commission has been working over the past six months for it to listen and learn from technical experts, county residents, and engaged stakeholders to come up with a recommendation around this topic. Um, the recommendation is to promote a healthy food system supported by low carbon conservationist agricultural practices. And that's what we, we are going to focus on talking about this evening. Next slide. So this is the time in the programming where you get to start voicing your thoughts. Um, hopefully you have lots of things you would like to share this evening because this re really is about learning from all of you and what you would like to see. Uh, so I want everyone to take a minute and think about what a program that is focused around increasing access to healthy foods could look like in the county. Who would be involved in it? What are they doing? When is it happening? Um, what support is being offered? Where is it happening? What would be helpful to you and your neighbors? What does this program look like to you? And Carol, if you want to go to the next slide while folks are thinking. All right, so here's your opportunity to voice your thoughts. I see some hands up already. While we're talking, Carol's gonna be taking notes. Um, you'll see the her notes popping up in the slide. If you are not comfortable speaking, feel free to put your thoughts into the chat and I'm going to work on um, calling on people who have raised their hands as well as reading what is in the chat. So Abigail, I see your hand up. Well, one thing that I'd like to see is like maybe people could deliver fresh fruits and vegetables to like senior citizens and those with disabilities and who cannot go to a store to get fresh fruits and vegetables. And another thing that farmers could do with food that doesn't sell at the end of the day at farmers markets is to donate it to homeless shelters so that homeless people have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. And yeah, and like, and also I'd like to see um, like, especially for like um, people with food allergies, make sure that the vegetables aren't contaminated with peanuts or something, fruits and vegetables. I mean, I, I, it's not that it affects me, but for some people with food allergies, cross-contamination can be deadly. I think those are great points, thank you. Yeah, I'm not trying to scare no, I think I think that those are valid valid points, and we certainly appreciate them. Thank you. I, and Stacy, I see your hand up as well. Hi, good evening. Thank you for for, for recognizing me. Um, I'm with the NAACP Maryland State Conference. I'm the chair for environmental and climate justice. 
our branch of the NAACP is interesting, interested in partnering with the community of Brandywine. As everyone knows, Brandywine is an environmentally overburdened community with several climate um, issues from emissions to coal fire plants, et cetera. And they live in a near virtual um, food desert. And we'd like to know what, how can we best connect with the community of Brandywine and what resources do we have to help them develop um, community gardens that are centrally located attached to schools that have a curriculum um, around education, et cetera, because that is a beleaguered community and it is in desperate need of this kind of focus. And because the soil has been so contaminated by all of the um, issues that they have down there, how, what can we do to move toward getting some organic clean soil so that we can develop um, a community, develop more community gardens down in that area? Um. Anyone from the county want to field that question? <laughs> Carol, you're muted. I'm trying, I'm trying to type a lot of good things here. Um, I, you know, there, there certainly are some possibilities uh, for uh, plant-based remediation of contaminated soils. Um, Obviously, there are also uh, raised beds, you know, uh, if it's just not a good idea. So uh, this is not anything that we at the moment have uh, funding to do. But I would say that we're, um, you know, we're very interested in these programs uh, or these ideas. And I would like to say, I'm going to put my email in the chat in just a second. Um, we do have two programs that can help provide food forests. And one is tree relief, which is for uh, public areas. And then we also have Arbor Day Every Day for schoolyards. So if you're interested in those, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, obviously, whenever you're gardening in the urban area, you do need to be concerned about possible contamination. Even lead paint in older communities can be in the soil and persist. So, uh, you know, that's something that I think we need to all partner on um, and maybe we can get some resources in and some experts to help figure out the best ways to deal with it. Um, and I think yeah, and certainly there's an opportunity to partner with the Soil Conservation District there. I mean, there's been a real support, um, you know, recently in, in terms of like community advocacy around community owned, but also just like black owned, neighborhood owned uh, urban agriculture, urban farms, development of urban, urban farms, um, which would be not only, you know, not only a food source, but a revenue source for a person who lives there. Um, there's just a lot of, of, of opportunity, I think, in that space. And, you know, with renewed focus, I think, on, you know, environmental racism and environmental justice, that it's, it's a, you know, it's definitely a place that we would love to, you know, love to see to love to focus on. So I would also, you know, um, it's pretty easy to find me, but I would love to talk to you more, um, Stacey, about your thoughts and what we can do, you know, in that community in particular, but in communities across, you know, Prince George's County from that focus. Um, you know what, when I got on here, your name is not on your square. So uh, I'm Andrea Coombs. I'm the acting director of DOE. Stacey, I would say if you're comfortable putting your contact information into the chat, that way we'll have a record of it and um, the we can get you in touch with the appropriate folks to talk to about, about this topic since it is such a, a large one. Yeah, well, we're actively um, grant writing to get funding to start to do some work. We have soil testing monies available. So we really, we really want to really focus on Brandywine because we have done them a tremendous disservice by asking them to bear the brunt of all of these environmental hazards and do absolutely nothing to support them. So I would appreciate it if someone could reach out to us so that we can do the work that needs to be done to restore these people for all the good they've done for the state and for the county. And speaking, uh, speaking of Brandywine, uh, and you mentioned associated with the schools, we do have uh, an environmental agriculture and natural resource program at Gwen Park High School uh, right there in Brandywine um, that uh, for several years, their horticulture program was, was really a pillar in the community and the Brandywine community really supported it. 
Um, and that program left for some time, but is now back uh, doing the curriculum for agricultural science education. And so they, they do have an ag science program there, um, a fairly robust one that uh, I can definitely get you connected. Uh, they have awesome educators in that program. They have an FFA, Gwen Park High School chapter. And so whether it is a community garden or they already have gardens there and animals, um, but potentially expanding that and looping that in with, um, with our partners from DOE, as well as, you know, that could be potentially like an SYEP site right, specifically for that purpose of developing that area there, I think there's a lot of potential. So um, absolutely, uh, you can include me in that conversation. That would be awesome. Donald, maybe that's an opportunity to uh, do some more like the Homegrown Heroes project that we partnered on. Yeah, absolutely, Home Homegrown Heroes. And then Stacy, um, I will send you an email shortly. Uh, we 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 want to invite you to the EANR um, advisory meeting as well. And What's so those, that? So, so that the, we have three of those agriculture or environmental based programs in our school system. And this group meets to support those programs. And so they, the last meeting for this year has occurred, but they will begin again in um, September, October. We have people who are dedicated to, to seeing to that this works get, gets done. And I, and I don't like that we're in a silo. And I think we'd be much more effective as if, if we could build a coalition to get a garden started down in Brandywine, or if not more. So I really would like to follow up with whoever will follow up with me to, to make that happen. And unfortunately, I, I can't see your face. I knew, I've seen you, you before, but tell me your name again. You were just talking, sir. Oh, I'm Donald Bell with, with uh, Prince George's County Public Schools. I'm also one of the commissioners uh, for the Climate Action Plan. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, I, I have your name written down, but yeah, I really would, I'm gonna put my information in the chat, but if someone could reach out to me, I would really appreciate it. All right, thank you all. I wanna, um, not to cut this conversation short, but it's, it, it's important, but I wanna give some other folks an opportunity to, um, to speak as well. So other hands I see raised, um, Brianna or Brianna. So I was thinking that as a student at my school, they recently built a victory garden. So I was thinking that other schools could have, you know, implement victory gardens to have their own, you know, vegetables and, you know, produce growing, you know, at their own school. So I think that could be a really good idea. I love that idea. Um, Chloe. Hello, yes, um, a few comments. One, building on the community garden conversation that was just happening. Stacy, I'd love to get in touch with you too. I'm with the Prince George's County Food Equity Council. And we're working on putting together a community garden summit from some of the um, jurisdictions in the counties that have community gardens, kind of train other communities on best practices for how that works. So that's kind of a, a side point that I'd, I'd love to connect with you on and, and see if we can help um, from the Food Equity Council's perspective. I also wanted to raise, you know, in terms of the healthy food access, um, Point, the county has a food security task force that's working right now um, to come up with recommendations, policy recommendations for the county to implement um, in response to you know, what we all witnessed during COVID, but also over the longer term and as you know, climate um, disasters become more frequent. So um, I just wanted to recommend really making sure that we're syncing the recommendations in the climate action plan with what around healthy food access to what this food security task force um, is coming up with as well. And then really broadening that concept to nutrition security, right? It's not just food security, it's we need to make sure people are getting adequate nutrition. And then two more points I wanted to raise. One is in terms of mitigation, like climate mitigation, one of the biggest things that we can do is um, around waste and shifting diets. Um, when it comes to our food system, those are going to be really big impact activities, as well as, you know, healthy soils practices, carbon sequestration, 
but really where we're gonna get the biggest measurable reductions are gonna be food waste, which we talked about in another session, but we haven't talked about shifting diets and really looking at leveraging the county's procurement power um, for schools, but also for other institutions to shift toward more climate friendly foods, towards more fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds that tend to have a lower carbon emission, lower carbon emissions. And then my last point is while we're at it, you know, we should be integrating other values into the county's procurement. So I appreciate that somebody wrote in the chat that the county has a rich history in terms of black farmers. We continue to have the most black farmers in the state in the county, but what is the county doing to support those, the black farmers that we have? Are we, do we have any goals around purchasing from those black farmers, you know, putting our money where our mouth is? So this is another objective and something the Food Equity Council has been working on for a long time. Our jail, of course, is another um, large purchaser of food that's serving a vulnerable population in the county where we have really serious issues um, in terms of food quality, food environment, food sourcing practices. So I would love to see that um, included in the Climate Action Plan as well. And sorry to go on for so long. Um, no, those are all great points. Thank you. Um, VJ. Yeah, I know, um, I know that Maryland uh, has a tax on like sugary drinks. So I'm wondering whether the county can think of policies that, you know, not just promote, you know, healthy food, but also, you know, limiting the proliferation and, um, you know, abuse and, you know, I, and I don't use this word lightly, like straight up addiction to unhealthy food that, you know, causes a lot of health problems in so many people. And I know it's, it's, I know it's, it's, it's a pretty controversial issue to a, some people because, you know, there's a whole thing about personal liberty and, you know, what, you, what food you can choose to eat. But, you know, I maintain that, you know, the idea of food deserts, it's not just, you know, the absence of food. It's essentially the fact that the food options that people get to choose are just unhealthy ones. And a lot of, a lot of companies are just kind of capitalizing off of that, that tr are trying to push unhealthy food. Thank you. Um, I wanna move on to the next set of questions, but I wanna point out a couple things that were in um, the chat. There's some really great information and sources being put into the chat. Um, Robin, I see your comment about wanting to um, expand your sororities um, stuff to cover this. So if you could put, I would say, if you can put your contact information in the chat as well, so folks could reach out to you about how to make that happen and, and get folks that can come to your event to talk about reducing um, food waste and things like that. I think that would be great. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Um, and a lot of good links coming up in the chat about food policy and, and things like that. Um, I see a comment in here as well about um, utilizing the Master Gardener program to start community or school gardens. And also with school gardens in mind, reaching out to culinary programs at high schools that could be useful as well. So um, again, a lot of really great thoughts coming up in the chat. Um, Carol, and you can contact me for uh, the Master Gardener Coordinator. I'll, I'll put you in touch with us here. Um, Carol, can you go to the next slide, please? So thinking about what this program would could look like, the next question is what are the challenges and what are the opportunities that you see with the expansion of this program? Um, I feel like there's thoughts on this already. Uh, VJ. I, I, I think Abigail had her hand up before I did. Oh, so I okay. Wanted a chance to go right. first. Abigail? Well, one thing that, like, I mean, what's really a problem is that this area is so big and yet there's so much homelessness and and a lot of homeless people can't get healthy food and and some areas where it's, it's like food deserts you know it's really hard to get access to healthy food so 
And also for people on social security or limited income, getting affordable, healthy food is just a big problem. And what's really scary is that it's cheaper to buy convenience food than fruits and vegetables. And that needs to change. They should lower the lower price the of price fruits of and vegetables and raise the price of convenience food. I right. That. Um, so a challenge being then making sure that um, homeless people, um, people on social security, those that are financially challenged can um, get this food. And, and I think that goes back to a previous comment about can we have food delivered to people if they can't get out and get it themselves? I think that that ties together nicely. Thank you. Um, VJ, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as far as opportunities, I do want to emphasize the education aspect in that it really doesn't take a lot to get people started. And a lot of times, and I can speak for myself, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't grow, grow up kind of doing a lot of gardening or, or vegetable planting or anything similar. So for a long time, I was like really intimidated by even attempting it. I thought, oh, I'll just wait, waste a lot of time and money trying to do gardening and it'll, all my plants will die and it'll be just like a huge failed project and I'll be really sad about it. But, but then, you know, with, with the right guidance and it really doesn't take much, you know, a lot of people can be can be made to just overcome that initial intimidation and really just get going. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of it, whether it's in schools or in community centers or, you know, libraries can have like little workshops and, you know, and, and sort of, they can even be sort of, you know, advertised in a way that's like, look, we, we know it's like intimidating, but it doesn't have to be, you can do it. Mm -hmm. a, a buddy gardener program. Um... I support that. Uh, Stacy. I see your hand up. Again, thank you for recognizing me. I, another thing too, and I think someone mentioned, alluded to it earlier, you know, let what's happening in California be a harbinger of what's to come. And I really think we need to be more proactive in ensuring that communities that not only now are beleaguered with, you know, um, being in a food desert, but that they can prepare themselves against what's to come with the change in our climate, because it's going to be more and more difficult. I mean, you know, I don't know if anyone noticed chicken wing prices are going through the roof. I could not find any fresh basil. I went to several um, um, grocery stores. You know, food availability is going to be a real e issue even for the affluent. So we really need to be proactive in getting our, our community um, established establish with these local gardens. Thank you. Um, some other comments in the chat about, um, going back to VJ's comment about the right guidance being so important. Um, and master gardeners, again, can be very helpful. Um, Someone reiterating uh, the comments about food availability in general. Um, other thoughts about challenges or opportunities? Um, I again see this as a really great educational opportunity starting with kids, right? Um, if you can start kids in school learning how to grow simple vegetables, take a tomato plant home with you kind of thing, right? And then teach mom and dad about it. Um, I think that there's a great opportunity for education um, that also helps navigate some of those challenges as well. Um, any other thoughts before we, um, Linda says, my kids taught me so, so much about gardening. Um, they learn things so much faster than, than we do. Um, other thoughts about uh, challenges and opportunities before we move on to the next set of topics. All right, Carol, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Yep, and in answer to the chat, the county does have uh, an extension service. And uh, you can, there's lots of wonderful information to be had there. And I'll try to get that typed in while I'm doing the other type. Thank you. What is the extension service? Uh, University of Maryland. Uh, they have lots of 
information and programs on gardening. Um, it's, uh, it's, it has many different aspects to it, including mm -hmm. master garden programmers run from that. The extension service deals with all things that are sort of um, plant and agriculture related from master gardeners, but also they work with um, people in communities on stormwater management and things like that as well. So they cover all sorts of um, really great topics and they're there to help people with um, issues like this. Um, Okay, so the next thing that we want to talk about, um, oh, and I just see someone put something in the chat about 4-H as well. That would be another great resource. Um, with this program that we've been talking about that's focused around um, access to healthy food, uh, who benefits from this program? Who is burned or left out? And how do we ensure equitable outcomes? Again, keeping in mind that it's really important to the county that the Climate Action Plan is implemented in an equitable fashion so that we don't negatively impact already underserved and overburdened communities. And we wanna make sure that they are included in this process and, and reap the benefits of the program as well as, as others do. So who benefits, who's burdened or left out and how do we make sure that this, this program is equitable? Anyone? I feel like we've already talked about some things related to the equity aspect of things, right? Making sure that people who can't get out on their own have access to healthy food and people that can't afford healthy food have access to it. Um, so I feel like we've touched on a lot of these things already. Uh, Stacy, I see your hand. Sorry, you know, it's really interesting when we talk about equity. I also think about equity, equity along racial and financial lines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really have been focused on what we in the NAACP we refer to as um, ground zero or hotspots of which, you know, Langley Park is, um, Hyattsville, Bladensburg. And like I said, I think the biggest place that really needs the most focus is Brandywine. And when we talk to these communities, they often say, you know, the county doesn't hear us. They don't do anything for us. So I don't understand where the disconnect is and why it is that when we go to the, some of the churches in, in these communities, Communities, when we reach out to the, some of the fence line um, organizing groups, they're like, we don't know whether the, the county isn't hearing us. You know, we, we had these Title VI wins, we're not getting air quality monitors, we're not getting soil testing. And it's like, I, I don't know where the, where like you're, you're missing one another. So I'm really trying to figure out where's the disconnect. And you're saying, yeah, well, we're really looking out for these things, yet people are saying, they never hear from you. So I, I, I just don't get it. I don't know who you're talking to because the communities that are affected that I talk to, they're like, they're not hearing us. So I, I am happy. I don't want to, you know, burden this, you know, this event with um, talking about it. But, you know, if we could chat, I really would like to see if we can like bridge the gap here because we're not connecting. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think it's an important point. Um, VJ, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, as, as, as to a point of how do we ensure equitable outcome, um, I feel that the county can take a proactive effort to kind of, you know, arrange for donating a lot of supplies and tools to get people started with gardening, like, you know, because, it, you know, to some degree, it does require like a lot of money and investment, like to getting, you know, fertilizer, soil, you know, seedlings, tools, irrigation, I mean, a, a lot of it. And so, um, you know, education and kind of the fear of doing it is one barrier. And then the other barrier is people thinking, geez, you know, to start a garden may cost quite a bit depending on how you approach it. But if you, in addition to saying, look, you can start a victory garden or something and here's everything you need to do it. I think that'll go a long way to kind of just get people doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I lived in Richmond for a long time and there were some folks there that started a tool co-op to do exactly what you're talking about, right? People could sort of check out tools or donate tools they didn't need anymore when they got new ones to help people who wanted to do this sort of thing on their own 
have access to some of those things. So I think that's a great point. Um, Chloe, I saw your hand next. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I really appreciated Stacy's comments as well. And I think that for one of the things that the county can look at um, in order to ensure equitable outcomes, particularly when it comes to food, is really utilizing um, the county's definitions for um, healthy food priority areas. The county and the health department has done a lot of work with GIS mapping to figure out where are these healthy food priority areas, where are people um, you know, suffering from the most diet related disease, where do we see a lack of grocery stores and overabundance of unhealthy options um, and focusing interventions there. And so I think we really need to set the goals for this around um, equity and reducing racial health disparities in particular and be very intentional naming what those communities are, what are the environmental justice communities in the county, what are the healthy food priority areas, and have, you know, whether it's a funding formula or something that makes sure that an equitable portion of resources are invested in those places is really important. Thank you. Um, other thoughts on um, I feel like we've talked a lot about how do we ensure equitable outcomes, but what about who benefits from this program and who is burdened or left out of this program? Everyone benefits. <laughs> And I, I would agree if it's if it is executed properly, yes, everyone definitely should benefit. Um, just taking a look at the chat to see what all is in there. Um, Chloe, did you have your hand up again, or is that from? Um, oh, sorry, I'll take it down. No, that's fine. I uh, just want to make sure that. The, you didn't want to add anything. Um, all right, then let's move on to the last set of questions. Um, Carol, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, given all the things that we have talked about, then what does success in the county look like in the next three to five years? Um, what do you need to see? Are there research and data needs or policy and ordinance changes? residential outreach efforts, monitoring, evaluation, anything like what does the what does success in this program look like in the next three to five years? Stacey? Grants and funding. Um, I see in the chat residential outreach being important um, with a significant financial investment behind it. Um, more universal voting in elections to encourage climate friendly council and elected officials. Um, less food waste. Another is supply chain. Um, you know, if we have these gardens, how do we get food dis distributed? Do we do it through the school system, send kids home with food? I mean, how do we manage once we grow this food? What's the distribution look like for the supply chain? Mm -hmm. um, I see a comment from Beth. I think this relates more to the last slide, but um, if the county is serious about wanting to hear from all residents, then you should consider paying people to participate in focus groups or interviews um, because it's not feasible for everyone to just volunteer or donate their time. I think that that's a really great point. There's a lot of people who can't participate in conversations like this because um, although it's slightly easier since we're doing things virtually, but you know, there's a large portion of the population that can't take time out from childcare or work to go to a public meeting and voice their opinion. So I think that's a really great point. Oh my gosh, so many things just popped up in the chat. Um, monitoring and evaluation is important for keeping the health of the land at a high level for growing food. 
um, especially in the urban areas. I think that's a great point and something that would need to go into this three to five year success. Um, other thoughts? We have two minutes left. This is your final, your final chance. Are you going to copy the chat and send it out to the distribution list or should we do it ourselves? Um, everything, the presentations, and I'm, I don't know if that includes the chat or not, Carol, do you know if the chat's going to be made public? I think that that's what Brandy said. The chat would also be posted, correct? It, yes, the, the chat is going to be available. So the chat and the recordings of um, all of the sessions, the main sessions and, and the breakouts will be made available through a, a, web, a web link. You can also save the chat yourself by clicking on those three little dots down in the where you would type a message. There are three little dots on the right side. Uh, click on that, save chat comes up and the chat will appear in a little folder in your uh, documents under Zoom. If I may make a comment, um, I don't know if this is in closing or appropriate, and please stop me if you don't have the time, but I am encouraged by the comments that I see in the chat and the people who are on this, on, on this Zoom. I really hope that I don't have anyone's contact information. I can find you all, and I've written down many names, but I really hope that we can at least meet to start to formulate a, a plan, an actionable plan, to really move forward to establishing um, um, food equity in some of these um, um, hotspot or um, is ground zero places that have food issues. And And p people who know a lot about this stuff, please um, sign up to be a resident expert. 